Chapter 2 Ginny pulled in close to the porch with a sigh of relief she didn't bother to hide, since she was pretty sure her passengers wouldn't notice or care. Of course, relief at not ending up in a snowbank was tempered with unease about what came next. The cabin was lit up like Christmas was coming. It always was lit up, since no one bothered to take the lights down. At least Christmas really was coming this time. And it was a good thing Mom had left the lights on, because through the last few bends in the road, that had been the beacon she followed. If this wasn't a full-on blizzard, it was the first cousin to one. She gripped the wheel for a couple of seconds, but she had no idea what to tell the kids. She could sort of remember being 13, but nine seemed light years away. What grade in school was he in? Third. Fourth. She didn't dare ask because it all depended on when he'd started. I need the password to the Wi-Fi, Daphne said. Ginny should have seen that one coming. I'll try to get that for you. The good news there was Wi-Fi, though someone, someone probably named Ginny, would need to sweep the snow off the dish. Which wouldn't happen tonight. No point when it was still coming down. The bad news, her mom liked to change the password just before incoming visitors arrived. She'd write the new one down on something random and put it in a safe place that could be almost anywhere in the cabin. Or back in the house in town. And just to make matters more interesting, she had little scraps of paper with code-looking words written on them that she kept inside the cover of her tablet. Sometimes she hid the new password in there, which meant someone had to go through the scraps every time. Ginny never could tell if it was innocent crazy or her mom yanking their chains. She saw Daphne make a face at her and decided to let her sort through the scraps this time. It would be good for her character. Ginny pushed open the driver's door and stepped out into blowing snow and a chill that cut through her Texas coat like it was a puff of smoke. At least it wasn't as cold as it could be since it was snowing, but her blood had thinned in warmer climes, so it felt cold enough as she told the lady at the rental desk earlier when asked about it. And the lady who had sold them bottles of soda and water. And every person they met heading out of the airport. Cue so many eye rolls from Daphne she looked like a zombie. She pulled open Isaac's car door in time to see him tuck a notebook and his electronic tablet into his backpack. His gaze was a bit too bland as it met hers. She knew that look or remembered it, but what could he be plodding up here in the snowy middle of not much? I'll get your suitcase out, she said, and waded through calf-deep snow to the rear of the SUV. Up on the spacious porch, the front door opened, spilling a hopeful shaft of light onto the white drift piled up there. The figure in the square of light wasn't her mother, who had gotten steadily smaller with each passing year and rolled in a wheelchair these days. Did she see the broad shoulders of a guy? Ginny? The voice was man-deep, and twanged a chord of memory she thought she buried too deep to twang. It couldn't be the boy next door, her best friend besides Van, her first love who'd left without looking back. He strode forward, the porch light briefly falling around him like a spotlight. Dexter James Toliver. In the flesh. Her head tipped to one side. In the much better than she remembered flesh and wearing the uniform of the local sheriff. Her thoughts did a kind of spin, but considering she had a thing, a thing that was kind of a marriage proposal that she wasn't thinking about, pending at home, the hallelujah chorus seemed inappropriate. Of course there was mistletoe hanging in the hall, and Dex managed to catch her under it. The kiss was both familiar and different, because he was a man, not the boy who had left her, but familiar enough to make her wonder if she was completely over. Not going there. With or without the proposal thing, she and Dex had finished a long time ago. Finished because he didn't come back, she reminded a heart pounding a little too briskly for her liking. She emerged from his embrace to find them under scrutiny by Biff's kids, and an inflatable green alien. Apparently, her mom had decided on a space theme for her decorations again this year. This would be the second or third time. She'd done the first alien Christmas when Van got her job at NASA. The inflatable alien was an interesting twist. It was propped on the entry table with some garland around its neck. It wasn't even a good, inflatable alien. 
It was the requisite bright green, but looked like it hadn't been completely inflated or perhaps had been left out in the sun. She might think the alien reprise was for her. Only her mom didn't know about Ginny's secret life as a science fiction romance author. Even if she did, that wouldn't beat NASA. Their mom had been a NASA fan since JFK challenged them to get to the moon. And Van had always been mom's favorite. Ginny half smiled, missing her sister's retort that Ginny had always been the fav. She might want Van to bust a move to take charge of the stepkids, but mostly she just missed her sister. So that she wouldn't sigh again, she headed into the great room. If Ginny had hoped that one alien was it for the My Daughter Works at NASA celebration, her hopes were quickly dashed. There was another one, the wide lidless eyes seemingly watching from the massive fireplace as they straggled in. Her mom waited in her wheelchair in front of a tree littered with spaceships, planet ornaments, aliens, and a NASA cap where the star usually crookedly clung. The only thing really Christmas on the tree were the lights. There was the Spock figurine, its place of honor front and center. Mom had always had a thing for him and kept asking when Van planned to bring him home for a visit. Even Leonard Nimoy's passing hadn't altered her mom's belief that Spock worked at NASA. Vanessa, she said, her arms held out for a hug, where's Buff? The meme that a mother could tell her identical twins apart? Yeah, not always true. Ginny found herself exchanging a very familiar, very wry look with Dex, just like a thousand or so years and tears didn't lie between now and their last goodbye. They are coming in tomorrow, Mom. She hoped with all her heart she spoke the truth as she bent to hug the near skeletal remains. She was so thin Ginny was afraid she'd break her if she hugged too hard. She pressed a kiss to paper-thin skin, feeling a familiar swirl of emotional heartburn. Love, worry, frustration, and yes there was some relief at being home, this sense that she'd gotten younger just by walking through the front door. Ginny took care not to look at the kids, though she couldn't block out Daphne's derisive snort. She made a vague gesture in the direction of the kids. Daphne and Isaac, Biff's kids. Kids this is, you're my mom Mrs. Prescott. Please call me Daisy. She beamed at them, not noticing when the beam wasn't returned. Well, so nice to finally have grandchildren. She turned back to Ginny, who had known that guilt trip was coming and packed for it. Wasn't it nice of Dex to stay with me, so that Pleasance could go? Since you had to arrive so late. He was worried that it might be embarrassing for Van, since she got married and all, but I said that was all over years ago. This made Biff's two turn to give him speculative looks. Ginny had no desire to help him after the kiss, but Dex had always been able to help himself. I dated Ginny, Daisy, not Van, he said easily, his deeply amused gaze holding hers. She tried not to react, since the kid's attention swung back her way again. Daphne's expression complicated, like she couldn't imagine Ginny ever being young enough to date. Then Ginny kind of didn't care what they thought as Dex's look, one far too familiar for how long it had been since she'd seen it, kept coming. He'd always been able to tell them apart, she recalled a bit vaguely, as the past stirred up something that might have been embers. Because she was tired from the flight and the drive, she told herself. Christmas was for sentimentality and remembering and, and stuff. It would be strange if her brain weren't wandering down memory lane. Remembering didn't mean anything but, well, remembering. I thought I heard you got married or something, Ginny said, to remind the remembering that it hadn't all been that great when he left. I got engaged, he admitted, never made it to the altar, though. Since she hadn't either, she didn't call him on yet another failure to follow through on a commitment. She broke the gaze and turned back to find Mom watching her with a look that was uncomfortably speculative, and loaded with the potential for more embarrassing to be incoming. She asked with some haste, so where do you want us to put our stuff, Mom? Well, you're in your bedroom, of course. Dex, will you show the children to their rooms? Dinner is Chinese this year. That could be good or bad. It wasn't like there was delivery up here and her mom's cooking skills tended to come and go, though for the last ten years they'd mostly gone. I'm trying a new recipe, mom called as they followed Dex back out into the hall. Are you staying for dinner, she asked, got a wry nod. 
No good deed ever goes unpunished. Dateline, Isaac Strategic Planning Notebook. Have to assume I'm snowed in. Otherwise, would already be gone. These people are very strange. While interesting, I don't trust that old lady. I wonder if she knows. Dateline, Daphne's cell phone. No bars. No Wi-Fi. If a teenager cries in the forest, no one knows because there are no bars. Dateline, Advanced Scouting Party Report. Land vehicle arrived despite weather. Protocol deployed. Should have gone to Disneyland.